in our workplaces, in our, in our world, in our friendship groups, and in some of our homes, the walls of righteousness have fallen down. Our city is overrun by, by the enemy and his hordes of minions. And, and God is looking for someone in this church. God is looking for someone in this world to, to work with him in rebuilding the wall of righteousness. He's looking for someone who will stand in the opening of the wall and speak truth to lies, shine light in the darkness. He's looking for someone to proclaim the hope of Christ in a needy and a hopeless world. And he's asking this morning the question, will it be you? I recently read an article on a news w a w website which spoke about a family who had a birthmark. And each family member had the same one, which was a white mark through their hair. And it wasn't just the family who were alive now, but, but all of the immediate family since the 1800s had carried the same white mark through their hair. Uh, and the family thought it was excellent. They embraced it. They, or they said, uh, it was what I did identified them as a member of that family. It said at the end, it said, no matter where in the world any of them were, they would always recognize each other because they shared a birthmark. My friends, the family of Jesus, the church, Christ, Christians, those who've been made news, those who have been born again, have birthmarks which identify them as born-again believers, members of the family of God. And this morning, in the passage we've just read out, Jesus teaches us three of them, three birthmarks of the born-again. And those three are that the born-again receive the light, share the light, and live the light, receive the light, share the light, and live the light. And, and that means that wherever we are in the world, we will always recognize each other as being our brother and our sister, our mother and our father, being part of the family of Jesus because of these three birthmarks that we hold, receiving the light, sharing the light, living the light. And it begins this morning with that first one, receiving the light, receiving the light. What do I mean by that? Well, in our parable last week, Jesus compared the word of God to a seed. Uh, but this week, he compares it to a light, a lamp that is lit, a light. And this is a direct echo of a famous verse many of you will know in Psalm 119, verse 105, which says this, your word, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's Bible, his word, it says, is, is, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And that is what Jesus is echoing in this passage by comparing the word to a lamp, to a light, because the word of God illuminates. The word of God brings clarity to our situation, to who we are, to what's happening in the world around us, to the past, the present, the future. It illuminates who God is and his plan and his purposes. But not just that, it directs us how to live, where we have been, where we are now, where we should go. It directs us in this world, which means that the Word of God, though it looks like it, is not just words on a page. No. That it is being breathed out by the divine mouth of God and placed into the, into the chosen arms of men to be written on a page for us. This, this, is, this is a divine, heaven-breathed word. Far more than words on a page. And the first birthmark, the first 
thing which identifies us as a member of the family of God is receiving it. And receiving it initially and then continually. And it's that first one to receive it initially. I just want to spend a little bit of time on. Because before we were born again, before we were spiritually made new, God had to awaken us to the light of his word, to the good news of Jesus contained within it. Before you and I were born again, we were spiritually blind. The revelation of God was unknown to us. The glory and the truth of God contained within was unknown to us. It was of no use to us until God awakened us to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep, three of you do. Good. Let me explain then for everyone else. If a blind man walked into this hall, and every light was off. And then as he walked in, we turned on all of these lights. Would it affect him at all? No. Would he even realize? Would he even care? No. Why? Because he's blind. And for light to be known, for light to be appreciated, we need a living organ, which for us is our eyes, to be able to receive that light. And as it is with natural light, so it is with supernatural light. When you were born again, when you believed in Jesus, when he awoke you to the truth of Christ, you received a new heart, which is now able to love God and obey him. You received a new mind, which is now able to understand the Lord. You received new ears, which is now able to hear him through his Holy Spirit and his word. You received new spiritual eyes that is now able to perceive him, now able to to see him and his truth. You are a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Utterly made new. Which does mean if you are not a new creation in Christ, if you've not been made new, if you are not born again, if you've not received the light of his word, the light of Christ, then you do not understand the supernatural revelation, the supernatural truth of God found within. Because you are a natural person and only a spiritual person can understand what God is saying in his word. That's what the, uh, the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says this, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are Folly, they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned, spiritually understood. And then Paul continues and says, that person who spiritually understands is a spiritual person. So you've got a natural man and a spiritual man. And the natural person has not been born again. They've not been awoken to the light of Christ. Um, they do not believe in Jesus, therefore they are not made new, which means this. Their path is not directed by the light. Their life, the way of life, is not lit up to them. Which is why some of you in this room, perhaps, and those who are not here, who do not know Jesus, go this way and that way in the world, and eventually they fall over and stumble and trip because they're walking in darkness, spiritual darkness. Friends, if you have only been born once, nat naturally, then you must be born a second time, spiritually. And that is a work which only God can do in you. And so this morning, you must believe in Jesus. You must believe that he's lived a life you could not live. And he died a death on a cross. You should have died for your sins. And then that he rose again 
to glorious life, to give you glorious life. And if you believe in Jesus and ask God to make you new, forgive your sins and give you new birth, he will do it because all those who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. That's the truth. That is the gospel. And for those of us who have been born again, those of us who do believe in Jesus, what a privilege we have. Because the birthmark is not just that we initially receive the life, but the birthmark which identifies you as a Christian is that you continually receive the light of the word. And Jesus in this parable shows us two encouragements to continue to actively receive his life. And, and we need that because we said last week we're at war and it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to receive the word of God. It's hard to get into the word of God. But Jesus encourages us this morning. And, and the first one that we see in the picture of this lamp is this. The more light you receive, the more you see. The more light you receive, the more you see. If we turn off every light in this hall, what will you see? None. If we turn on one light in this hall, what will you see? Something. If we turn on every light in this hall, what do you see? Everything. Everything. Because the more light you see, uh, because the more light you receive, the more you see. And, and what Jesus shows us in this picture is that the more of the word of God I receive and understand and implement in my life, the more I understand about life, the more I understand about God himself, uh, the more I understand about myself, the more light I receive, the more I see. It, it stops you from spending hours, months, and years saying, God, should I marry this person or that one? Because you've read the word, and you know from the word what a Christ-like spouse should look like. You know from the word what God says about being unequally yoked. And so, and so you don't need to spend as much time going, oh, God, what shall I do? Because he's told you. You don't have to spend as much time confused with what the world is teaching us about gender and sexuality. Because you've read the word, you've received it, you've understood it, you've believed it. And, and you see that God made two genders, male and female. And that marriage is between a male and a female. And so you're no longer confused, but you've also read the word. And you see that God teaches us to be loving and kind and patient with all people. And so, and so you're not any longer confused with the truth, but now you also know how to treat those in love who are confused with the truth. Because the more light you receive, the more you see. But the encouragement doesn't end there to receive this light. Because then Jesus in this picture shows us that the more light you receive in you, the less darkness is in you. The more light you receive in you, the less darkness is in you. If we come back into our hall, if I turn off every light in this room, what is it? It is dark. If I turn on one light, what is it? It's less dark. And then if I turn on every light, what is it? It's not dark. There is no darkness in this room, the more light that is in it. And so it is with us. The more light, the more of the word of God that is in you, the less darkness, the less sin, the less hurt is in you. The Bible has a, a posh word for this. It's called sanctification, which is the progressive process of becoming holy, of becoming like Jesus. Or you could also understand it as the progressive process of growing in our experience of the freedom and the abundance that Christ has already won for us. Because that's what holiness is. It's a life of freedom in Christ. 
if you look back at the last five years of your Christian life, or maybe the last five months, I don't know how long that you've been saved, if you just look back uh, to where you were and to where you are now, can you say, yes, pastor, I've experienced sanctification. I'm not perfect because it's a progressive process, but I can see that I once was this, and now I'm this. I know that I am able to. I know that for me personally, uh, that the more of the word of God I have received in my own life, the more truth is in me to overpower the lies of the enemy. The more healing words are in me uh, to heal the hurts of life and this world. The, The more of the word of God that I've received in me, my desires to do wrong, my desires to self-sabotage my own life with my sin has grown less. But my desires to do the will of God, my desires to enjoy the goodness of God has grown more. I can see that. I can see that and, and I can be assured of that because God says the good work he has begun in me, he will bring to completion. And so sanctification is a work of God in us that we work with him in. And yet, and yet still, still, we think, how can the word of God help me with that? Because I know, Pastor Will, that you said it's not just words on a page, but to me, it does look like words on a page. It's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul calls the Bible the mind of Christ, which means that the more of the mind of Christ you receive, the more of Christ you receive in you. And if I'm not mistaken, John chapter 1 calls Christ the Word, and it says that the Word has in him life, and that life is the light of humanity. And then it says the light shines in the what? The darkness. And the darkness what? cannot overcome it. Because the more of Christ, the more of his word, the more of his mind, the more of his light, the more of his life I have in me, the less darkness I have in me. Oh, I like this. I'm encouraged by this. This this is something I can hold. This is something I can do. I can receive the light. I can receive the light initially and continually. Uh, But it's not just that which is a birthmark of the born again. There's a second one. And that is that those who receive the light also share the light. Those who receive also share. I remember back home, during my childhood, we, I don't know why, but we sometimes, we went through a season of power cuts. Um, and these days, you just use your, f- your phone to shine a light in the house, and everybody in your household probably has one. But, but back then, we didn't have that. We had one um, torch in the whole house, and so we couldn't light up every room that we needed. And so we went old school, and we used the, the, the candles that we had. And we would light them and we would set them up high so that the light could shine and reach every corner of the room that they were in. And so through the candles that we had, through the lights that we had, we could light up every room. And I remember during those seasons, our neighbors coming over in our house were, were lit up with the flickering flames and they would pop over and they would ask if they could have some. And so the candles that we had, which lit up our, our house, we then shared with those who were living in the, in the darkness. And the more candles we had, the more light we had, the more we could share with those who needed it. And this is what Jesus expects of us. That we receive the word of God and we hold it high in our heart. It's prominent in our lives. And we share it with others who need it. Well, this is what he says in verse 16 to 17, where he speaks about a person who's been born again, who is in the kingdom of God, and, and they've received the word, they've received the light, but then they try to hide it. 
Christians can, can try to hide the light. This is what he says. He says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand up high in your life, up high in your, in your heart, in your priorities, so that those who enter, those who enter into your world, into your life, may see the light. For nothing, he then says this, you try to hide it, but nothing, he says, is hidden that will not be made manifest, will not be revealed, will not be seen, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Some Christians, and I know in my life over the years, I have done this. And I'm sure you have done this, that, that we have moments, we have an, uh, an experience where we should have shared the light, but we hide it. But some Christians go through their whole Christian life hiding the light. But God says, you can't. It will come out eventually. You might try to hide it, he says, but he will raise up somebody in this church. Somebody in this town, somebody in this world who will not keep silent about the word of God. And they will shine the light that you should have shared. And this, and this, is, this is the moment in the sermon this morning that God has brought you for. So listen. Because God commands us to share the light. And he wants that person who shares it to be you. He's not talking to the person next to you. He's not talking to the person in front of you. He's talking to you. He wants you to be the person who shares the light. And I know as I say that straight away, some of you are thinking, but I struggle. I struggle to share the light. I get anxious. I get fearful. Oh, but past isn't sharing the light, the job of others who are more qualified, who are more talented than I in communicating these things. Oh, but, but also past, I don't feel worthy to. I've sinned, I've messed up. I can't stand in front of a friend or a family member or someone in work and tell them about the love of Jesus when I'm such an unlovable Jesus person. I tell you what, Pastor, I'll just, I'll stay in the background and I'll pray that God will raise up people to share the light. And that's good. You should pray for God to raise up people to share the light. But what if, just, just think about this, what if the answer to your prayer is you? God wants you to share the light in the dark room that you inhabit in the workplace, in the family, in the friendship groups, in the town that you live in. And it, it doesn't matter that you've tripped up, slipped up, and messed up because Jesus forgives those who confess their sins to him and you are made worthy in Christ. You don't need a PhD in theology or anything else. You are called and qualified in Christ. If you know for God so loved the world that he would give his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, you got it. You've got it. If you know Jesus loves you, you've got it. You're already shining the light of the word of God in a dark world. God doesn't call for specialists. He calls for Christians. And I like that because God specializes in taking Christians from fear to faith, from struggle to strength, from using your weakness to reveal his power. We've got all these famous evangelists in the world and throughout history, but they are just one candle in a big house. They can only light up the one room that God has placed them in. You can reach people that those famous evangelists, you can reach people that I or Watson or Sarah can't reach. You've got access 
to your children, you've got access to your parents, you've got access to your workplace, you've got access to friends that we don't have. And so God wants each candle, each Christian to light up the room that they are living in, the world that they inhabit. And eventually we will see every dark room lit up with the hope and the love of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the truth. Is there just one person this week who you can speak to, who you can share with? Just one person. Friends, if we love our neighbors, we will share the light. The more candles, the more light we receive, the more light we can share, the more light we shine together, the less darkness is in this town and is in this world. And that is a telling phrase, isn't it, when we're talking about the darkness becoming less because the darkness feels thick right now. Amen? The darkness in this world feels heavy. It feels strong. It feels thick. As the ideology around gender dysphoria and LGBTQ is pushed and pushed to our children and in our media, as we've seen a epic rise in abortion and, and in euthanasia. As we've seen a great rise in pornography and a decrease in true intimacy. As we've seen the highest rate of marriages breaking up and falling apart. We currently live in the most anxious and depressed and suicidal generation in history. The darkness in our house is thick. So what do we do with that? Do we argue about politics and social issues? Is that where we put our priority? Do we just put our heads in the, in the sand and hide and just hide in church and sing worship songs? Absolutely not. We share the light of Christ we have received to a blind and a dark and a lost and a hopeless and a confused humanity, many of whom we call family and friends. That's what we do. And Jesus is saying, that's you. That's you. You are the one who can choose this week to either hide or shine. Will it be you? Our Lord said to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 22, 30. He said, I looked for someone in Ridgeway Church who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for someone in Ridgeway Church to stand in the gap of the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I found no one. My friends, in our workplaces, in our, in our world, in our friendship groups, and in some of our homes, the walls of righteousness have fallen down. Our city is overrun by by the enemy and his hordes of minions. And and God is looking for someone in this church. God is looking for someone in this world to, to work with him in rebuilding the wall of righteousness. He's looking for someone who will stand in the opening of the wall and speak truth to lies, shine light in the darkness. He's looking for someone to proclaim the hope of Christ in a needy and a hopeless world. And he's asking this morning the question, will it be you? May it never be said that he came to Ridgeway and he found no one. We all have a mouth. We all have a pen. We all have a computer. We all have a phone. And with our family, our friends, and our work, we all have an audience Faith comes through hearing the word of God. But friends, how will they hear if you will not tell them? You've been made and saved for great things. 
and the Holy Spirit will empower you for great things. To receive the life and to share the life. Those are the two first identifiers, the birthmarks of a born again believer. But before we end, there is a third. Because then Jesus says that the born again believer receives the the light, shares the light, and then also lives the light. And we move out of the parable and we go into the second section of our reading this morning as Jesus demonstrates in his own life, in his own example, uh, living the light. And this is what he says in verses 19 to 21. He says this, then his mother and his brothers came to him. His family came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you, but he answered them. My mother, my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Those who receive the light and live it. Wow. I'm not sure if Jesus could have been any more clear to us this morning that what identifies a Christian, what identifies a family member of God, what identifies a born-again believer is that they don't just hear the word, but they do it. That they don't just receive it, but they implement it. That they don't just uh, read it, but they live it. Brennan Manning, a very famous Christian author, said this. This is powerful. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is not evolution being taught to your children, is not militant atheism writing books and making films, is not any of those things, but is Christianity. Who acknowledge, who hear, who receive Jesus with their lips, but walk out of the door of church and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world, are you ready for this? That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We live in an age of Christianity where we have become more sugary than salty. More sugary than salty. Where we care more about other people's happiness than their holiness. Where we care more about people being comfortable in church than transformed in church. Uh, We live in an age of Christianity where we care more about our family and friends liking us than loving Jesus. I'll say that one again. We live in an age of Christianity where we care more about our family and friends liking us than loving Jesus. That breaks my heart. And this, this leads to a church and a pulpit and a pew where obedience and submission have become bad words. And hypocrisy and lukewarmness have become embraced. But listen. Listen. And this can change. Because there is nothing more powerful than a born-again believer who kneels in front of God and says, yes, Lord, I will, and then stands in front of a world and says, yes, you must. There is nothing more powerful than that. The age of Christianity we are in can change with people who kneel before God and then stand before the world. My friends, in his word, Christ has has enlightened us uh, to what it looks like and how to live a holy, a free, abundant life. And and he says it's not just through hearing, it's not just through learning, but it's through doing, implementing, 
We're living. And we can. We can. If you read the Bible, God says over and over again that we can through his grace. His grace is sufficient for us. That we can through his power. He, he, he will empower us. His Holy Spirit will, will come upon us to live a life as a witness of Christ in our actions and in our words. But it's not easy. No one's saying that. It's very simple. You hear and you do. You receive and you live and you share. But it's not easy. Oh, it's hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. And do you want to know where it's often hardest that I've found? In the context of family. That's where it's hard. To live obediently. Because they know what you were like back then. And they still treat you and view you as what you were like back then. Even though now you're over here. And it's so hard because we so easily slide and tumble and fall back there because we, we don't want to upset anyone, right? We don't want anything to be hard. We don't want to put them off Jesus, so we just don't live like Jesus. And it's not just me who found that hard, but Jesus Jesus shows us in this passage that actually in the context of family, that's where we need to live the, the light. It's in the context of our home life is where we need to live the light. In Mark chapter 3, we're told that some of Jesus' friends and the friends of his family believed that Jesus was mad, absolutely crazy, off his head with the things he was saying, the way he was acting. And his family heard this and his family obviously thought so as well so his family seemed to come and um, to come and see him to bring him away to give him some rest to help him so that he won't be mad anymore and so they ask him and say hey son brother please come with us and 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 Jesus hears that they are there asking for him and he doesn't just say no I can't I'm working but he says this incredibly hard saying. He says, they're not my family. My true family are these over here who hear my voice and follow it. I don't, I, that's really hard. That's really hard to hear. And it doesn't actually get any easier when we understand what, what Jesus means. Now, what he does not mean is that he doesn't care for his family. He doesn't love them. Because we see that when Jesus is crucified on the cross, he looks down at his mother and he looks down at John, his uh, 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 apostle, and he says, John, look after my mother as if she was your own. And so he obviously cares for his mother. He loves her. He loves his family dearly because Jesus is God and God is love. And so he loves his mother. He loves his sisters. He loves his brother. So, so what Jesus isn't saying here is don't care for them, don't love them. Um, but what he is saying here is that my earthly family do not take precedent over my spiritual family. That the desires and the commands and the will of my heavenly father supersede the desires and the will and the commands of my earthly father. When Sarah and I got married, we left our families and cleft to each other. We leaved and we cleaved. And when you come into a relationship with Christ and with his church, you leave and you cleave. You leave not just your sins behind, but you also leave your loyalties behind. You're no longer under the command and the authority 
of your earthly family, but you're under the command of Christ. And so you leave and you cleave. Because being born again makes you one with Jesus. And get this, the people of Jesus. We're one church, one people, one blood. And that affects how we spend our money. That affects how we spend our time. That affects how we spend our energy. That affects how we spend our midweeks. That affects how we spend our Sunday mornings. That affects how we parent. Because the desires and the will of our children does not supersede the desires and the will of God who tells us to bring up our children in the way of the Lord. It affects how we relate to our wider family. This is really hard. But this is really real. And it's real because There's a reason for this. Because those who can see cannot be led by those who are blind. And that's what Jesus is trying to stop right here because his family think he is mad and are trying to take him away from the word. And so Jesus recognizes that his family, though they love him, though they are speaking out of care for him, They are actually leading him away from the mission of God. They're leading him away from the purpose and the plan of God to save the world. And he he cannot allow that to happen. He cannot allow that to happen. And he, he recognizes that though my family love me, their love is blind. And I can see. And that's and that's what and that's what's happening here. He cannot let the darkness hinder the mission of the light. And his family won't see that. And your family won't see that. And there will be decisions you will need to make. There will be family parties, potentially, that you can't go to. And there will be family activities in those parties you can't play a part in. Uh, There will be a desire and an authority, potentially, from your parents. Of, of, of how you should treat them, of how you should treat your brothers and your sisters, of even how you should parent your children and the pressure which sometimes parents put on us for that. And you're going to have to shine a light and say no because God is my father and the church is my family. And that also means, friends, that we're going to have to be a family. We're going to have to hold each other up because this is really hard. We're going to have to look after each other, care for each other. We're going to have to help each other parent, help each other uh, with our money and our finances and all these other things that may be affected when we start to live the life. This is not an easy thing, but it's a good thing. And his family don't see that right now. I wouldn't be shocked if some of his brothers didn't want to speak to him ever again. I wouldn't be shocked if his mother was crying and upset and hurt. I gave birth to you. I brought you up. How can you do this to me, Jesus, publicly as well? I wouldn't be shocked if his family were very hurt and very upset. But, but, but Jesus, because he has received the light, because he is the light, he had eyes to see what they could not see. And he could see that this was for their best. Because Because Jesus continued to live the light, continued to live in obedience, even to the point of being crucified on a cross, the whole world was saved. But not just that. We eventually read at the end of Luke that his family was saved as well. His brothers became apostles. His his brothers became followers of Jesus. His, 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 His mother was standing at the cross recognizing him as the son of God. My friends, they didn't know that the light was good, but Jesus did. He could see further ahead and knew that by his obedience came their salvation. And so we love our families, but we are not led by them. Jesus knew that his family didn't need sugar, they needed salt. 
And we need to know that more than an organized mom, our children need a holy mom. More than a successful father, our children need a Christ-like father. More than a brother and a sister who is always present, we need brothers and sisters who are always prayerful. And so we love our families, but we're not led by them. And this is a hard saying, especially in a society which idolize family. Idolize family relationships. It's hard. But it's for their good and it's for our good. Bobby Richardson was a famous baseball player. And he, uh, he had a famous prayer because he was a follower of Jesus. And his prayer was this. Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And so this morning, Jesus has taught us, friends, that, that we need um, to receive the light initially and continually. We need to share that light into a dark world, and we need to live that light even in the context of our families. And these are the three birthmarks of a born-again believer. This is what identifies you as a born-again believer. And, and in this passage, we haven't even touched upon some of the other things that have been said, uh, such as where Jesus says, um, take care of how you hear his word and what you hear in terms of the teaching and the preaching of it. And where he's also said that those who receive and live and share more of the light, more of the knowledge and the blessings and the privileges of God will be given to them. But those who hide it, what they think that they had, they will actually lose. We haven't even touched upon any of that. There is one last thing. As I close and as the worship team come back up, because when I ask them back up, it actually makes you think that I will actually end. But it's just a little trick. No, as I close... I've been talking a lot about being born again. And there are some people in this room who maybe this morning you've gone, well, I've attended church all my life, but, but I'm not sure if I've ever really been born again. Or maybe you're new here and, and actually you're thinking, yeah, that this is the life I want. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want a new future. I want to go to heaven and not to hell. I want to follow Jesus. I want a new life. I want to be born again. I believe in God. Uh, maybe that's you. Maybe you want to be born again. You want to live in a life of light and live in the light of God. Well, I've got good news for you this morning. If you want to be born again, you can. And it is as simple, I've said this many a time, I'll say it again. It's as simple as A, B, C. It's as simple as A, B, C. The Bible teaches us that if you want to become a Christian, if you want to live in the light and be born again, if you want to go to heaven and not hell, if you want a new purpose, a new future, if you want your sins completely taken away and your past redeemed, then you need to admit that you are a sinner. You've broken God's law. You've not lived the life you should have lived according to how he's made you, and you need help. You need a savior. And then you've got to believe, A and B, believe that Jesus is that savior. Jesus is that help. Jesus is that light in a dark world. Believe in him that he died on a cross for you and rose again, and he will soon return as the coming king. And then commit. Commit to living your life for him, following him as Lord. He is now in charge of your life. He has authority over your life. Admit, believe, and commit. And if you do that, in your head and in your heart, you will be born again. You will be made new. Heaven will be your home. And so can I ask, every head is bowed, every eye is closed right now. The only people who are looking at you right now are the angels from heaven and God himself. And I want to pray a prayer in just a moment, which if you pray in your head and in your heart, then you will admit and you will believe and you will commit and you will become a Christian this morning. You will be born again. 
you may also want to pray this prayer uh, to realign yourself on the right path. Maybe you are saved, but you've just, you have wandered off and you go, actually, God, I need to come back. I need to admit some sins. I need to, I need to say again, I believe in you and I need to commit to you once again. And so I'm going to do that right now as the pastor prays this prayer. And so I'm going to ask a question. Nobody can see you, only me and I love you and only God and he is love. So I'm going to ask a question right now. Could you just raise your hand? if you want to become born again this morning? And could you raise your hand if you want to just recommit yourself to the Lord this morning, if you want to realign yourself to continue to receive his light, share that light and live that light. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. This is good news. This is a good day. Yes, God. Yes, God. Come and meet with these people right now, Lord. Come and meet with these people. If you can put your hands down. I'm going to pray this prayer. And as I pray it out loud, I want you to say every phrase after me out loud also. Everyone in this, in this, in this room, because we are a family, and we're going to pray with each other, hold each other up. So if we could all pray this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin my shame, and you were crucified for it. I believe that you took hell for me, so I would not have to. I believe you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. I turn from my sin to recommit my life to you. And now we all say these words loudly. And, sorry, our God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And heaven is now our home. In Jesus' name, and say this loudly, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.